Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Each week while working on the new album, the Dead Milkman ask each other a question. Viewer named Five Cell asks, each of you pick a Dead Milkman song and tell your personal story about it. Either the lyrics or the writing session or how it came to be. The backstory, whatever, thanks. Um, I'm gonna pick Big Lizard, the song Big Lizard. And this is how I remember the song coming about musically dean uh came into we were practicing uh in a cellar below. In my cellar my parents cellar no it was a cellar on ninth street in on uh, in philadelphia okay uh there was like a a korean grocer uh remember that place yeah Farming um, really yeah well, yeah, uh, whatever. And then we were in the basement uh, where we practiced maybe for nine months out of, not nine months in a row, but every two or two times a week or maybe once a week. So Dean brought in this riff that was the riff, the main, like, uh, ding, ding, uh. he said, I have these chords. And he said, but it needs something else. And then, like, I immediately thought of, like the count, the, you know, three more chords to add to it. And I don't know, somehow we got a, the structure of it right then, right then and there. And Dave played, Dave played his bass part. It seemed to come along, come very fast and organically to me, it seemed. And uh, Rodney, I don't know if he had, was thinking of these lyrics ahead of time or not but it just seemed like he had the lyrics by the end by the end of our practice it was all done he's pretty these lyrics quick. about the lizard but i do rodney remember, guy. He's pretty quick. where rodney and i had lived prior to this place where we moved we lived in maniunk and one of our roommates actually had an iguana that he let roam around that house it was a house a three-story house in man maniunk and uh, i think that's the inspiration for the lizard i don't know but that's the story of Big Lizard, as I remember it. Do you have any comments about the lyrics, Rodney? Do you remember anything? No, we don't have time. We've got 12, 13 questions to go through. It took 20 <laughs> minutes with his. No, oh. I'm moving on. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the story I wanted to tell was about uh, when I had the music for um, uh, Meaningless Upbeat Happy Song, um, which was a working title. And I just sent um, MP3 to you guys in an email. And I think within 24 hours, Rodney had uh, the lyrics as we know them today. Uh, and I was blown away just for, for many reasons. One, like I always admired Rodney's writing skills and to have it go along with a piece of music I wrote was really cool. Um, but how amazing the lyrics were in like such a short period of time. And I think Rodney said, you said something about um, like you heard the lyrics in, in the music somehow. The comment section is going to kill you because it's going to be always people going, Joe writes everything. Jesus <laughs> hands Joe all the lyrics on parchment. <laughs> <laughs> you guys do nothing. It's a joke. Uh -oh. <laughs> Don't pay attention to the, in the corner. <laughs> oh, he's, he's like seven drinks in, so, you know. Well, that, well that's, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> You're sticking to it? Um, uh, so I, I guess I'll address, I, we get this question asked a lot about Dean's dream. Yes, in fact, it was an actual dream that I had. And yes, I wrote the lyrics down pretty much as, as the song goes. I think Joe, I, I gave them to Joe to come up with some music. I don't remember it taking you very long to come up with music, Joe, maybe a couple days or whatever. And I think you only tweaked a couple of lines just to make them fit into the rhythm of the song. Yeah, I repeated some. Yeah, so pretty much the dream is pretty much verbatim as I like, 
as I had it. I, I got up and I, you know, I woke up and I wrote it down in, in rough form. And then I just kind of like sorted it out and gave it to Joe and said, here, give it a try. And he, he delivered. Did you give it, did you give it to him in the form that you had written it in? Because I've noticed when I, when I either document something like orally on a recorder, or if I write it down, uh, the language is like less coherent than it normally would be. I might have cleaned it up before I gave it, Joe. I can't yeah. remember. When I, when I record dreams, I wake up and just write key phrases down. I also do use a memory technique where if I wake up in the middle of the night from a dream that I want to remember, I have a little coast, coaster by the side, bedside table. I throw it on the floor. And then when I wake up in the morning, I'll, why is that on the floor? Oh, yeah, there's that dream. So oh that's how God, I do stuff. Brilliant. Yeah, it, it, it's a technique that's out there. Anyway, so that's my answer. Rodney? Uh, just because we're, we're short on time, just go watch the two videos for Prisoner Cinema. Just go watch those. Everything I can tell you about that song is in there. And you will see my struggle and you will feel for me. So, yeah, <laughs> please go watch that. But when I was suggesting that we go around and around, I didn't mean that specific question, although it worked. But I think we should stick to the, the order so then Joe can read the rest of his questions. Dan can read his. You can. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. What's your next question? Carlos Ramon wants to know, Dean, what kind of beer were you drinking? All right. So my my, my answer answer is it was probably Dale's Pale Ale, which is made by a brewery called Oscars Blues, I think. They originally started in North Carolina, but they have breweries now in Colorado and somewhere else. I can't remember. You get that a lot of places. Yeah, it's, it's pretty popular now. It's, it's like an IPA that I really like. So anyway, that's the answer to that. Roba Babu asks, what is your most memorable, memorable moment as a member of the Dead Milkman, whether on tour, in the studio, et cetera? Does somebody want to take this one? No, you, they're your questions. You're so it's my question. My, the, I remember Gibby Haynes coming into the studio to record vocals that Rodney uh, wrote lyrics specific. I don't know if you wrote them specifically for Gibby, but- You write all the lyrics. <laughs> Rodney doesn't write all the lyrics, but in, in, cause Dean wrote Dean's dream. Um, now we were in Austin, Texas, and I think Brian said, Brian, the producer, Brian Beatty said, what, uh, wouldn't it be, or somebody said, wouldn't it be great if Gibby sang on the song? Because I guess it was, uh, but all surfers. Anderson Walker and Bruford and Hal, right? Huh? Anderson Buttles, Bruford. It's called Anderson Buttles, Bruford and Hal, yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, Brian said, well, Gibby, I, I have Gibby's number. I can call him up and see if he wants to do it. And sure enough, he wanted to do it. But the thing I remember is that he came into the studio wearing a t-shirt of An Anderson Wakeman, Bruford and Hal. Yes. Uh, that t-shirt. And I was like, "That's is that synchronicity or... I don't know. That's pretty weird. That's a pretty weird thing because I don't remember Brian telling the name of the song, although it could have been a trick that he told him when we weren't there. Uh, I wouldn't bet, put it past Brian. To, to do a prank on us. But, He's a trickster. And, and Gibby said, oh, I didn't know that was the name. And so Gibby was playing along with it. But yeah, and he did it in two takes. Uh, he said, oh, you, you guys are making fun of us, aren't you? But he did it anyway. It was a good sport. And after... He, he after uh, he recorded it, uh, he said wanted us to come and see his car, his hot rod, and we went out and sure enough, in his parking lot was this awesome car, and he told us a story about how um, he drove it over ninety miles an hour, got arrested at night, and still the cop didn't give him a ticket because when he asked what, <laughs> what are you doing, he said I just wanted to see how fast it would go. <laughs> <laughs> That's Texas. <laughs> Families involved. That's what I remember. Okay. Okay, that's a good one. We'll go. We'll go with that. Well, Unless well, everybody else wants to add anything. Is that your three, Joe? Um, that's my three. <laughs> so should I not answer that one? You can answer it quickly. Yeah, go ahead. I would say there are two memorable moments. One, uh, the f the very first uh, note I played with you guys at the Trocadero for Dave's uh, um, tribute show. Uh, which was funny because I was really, 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 really nervous before that. And as soon as we started playing, I didn't feel nervous at all. Like I had no nerves the rest of that night. Um, 
But then Fun 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 Fest is where the other memorable moment. Uh, at the very, the very last song we were playing, uh, Two Feet Off the Ground, where the bass starts. And I'm playing the, you know, the bass alone, and then the battery got uh, effed up in the, um, the preamp, <laughs> or the, uh, yeah. And, um, every, you know, there was a lot of people there. That, that particular moment, there was a lot of people there. And, um, and I was like hitting the back of it. I think I ended up putting a new battery in there, but um, yeah, that's it. Okay. All right, so Dan, do you wanna go next? Oh, I just, oh yeah. So what, um, what were mine? The, oh, the story, what's the story behind your coolest scar? Do you have Thank one, you, Dan? Jill, nah. Um, shall, shall I, you go next, or do I have this? I'm breakfast. I'm breakfast. I'm breakfast. I'm breakfast. So do I answer that too? Yeah, or? answer it and then we'll answer it. All right, this was a tough one because I have a lot of scars, but I think the one that has the coolest story, for me at least, was, uh, uh, really drunk one night at the Pleasure Bungalow where the low budgets used to have practice and have shows. And um, one of Chris's old friends, Scotty, was also really drunk. And we were listening to Slayer, which I don't normally listen to, but I was really drunk. And uh, somehow a knife was introduced. And I think it may have been me because I used to carry around a tiny little pocket knife just for, you know, opening things or whatever. And I think I was like, ah, oh, and Scotty was a little crazy. Scotty was a little crazy. Joe knows what I'm talking about. Um, and I guess he brought out a bigger knife. And then he was like doing this while we were listening to Rain and Blood. <laughs> and then uh, somebody like a couple minutes later was like, what's all that blood on the floor? And we looked down and there was blood all over the floor. And I had this big gash in my arm. And uh, there was a, uh, yeah. And I didn't feel it, I guess, yeah. But then there was a girl at the show that was a nurse, and uh, she patched me up. Very nice. I'll go next. I only have one scar that I know, and it's on my it, – it's hard to see, yes. <laughs> um, I was uh, a, a young lad, and I was carving something, and I sliced the palm of my hand. Um, I don't even think I went to get stitches or anything. It's hard to see. I see a it's discolored kind of like, area. It's kind of like right there, but um, that's the only scar I have. I think I was just like – Carving wood or something. Yeah, that's it. Scars, Joe, Rodney. I'll pass. I don't have any. I'm trying to move Never. it along. Plus, if you can remember, I'm covered in scars, but I can't remember how I got any of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So what? I ask the next one. Yeah. Hey, keep going till you run out of your three. Yeah. If you could eliminate one uh, human invention, what would it be? Thank you, Brian Springer, for that one. Uh, my answer is simple, internal combustion gas engines. Just go right to uh, electric. Yeah, I, I, that was gonna be my answer too. Oh, shoot. Sure. Not me, I made a fortune off of Bitch and Camaro. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say the automobile. Yeah, that's oh, pretty much it. Wow. Okay. We can get around on bicycles and trains and whatever, but whatever. Well, that was interesting. Okay, if you could uh, erase uh, one, Dead Milkman album, what, which one would it be? That was Noel, I think, asked that one. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if mine counts, but uh, I would say the A side of the Smoking Banana Peels EP, but just the B side was perfect. <laughs> I listened to the, the A, you know, that's all the techno remixes, and they were interesting to listen to once, and then I just found, I don't think I ever really listened to them again. No yeah. Effect. I know you guys probably had yeah, I, a lot I mean, invested in that one. Album. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer this one. I mean, it's like killing your, your children or something. Uh, <laughs> Sophie's choice. I can kill my Terrible question. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Interesting question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you I know what? I thought it, it was like, it, 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 it struck me as like a Terry Gross kind of question. Like one that kind of like ugh, gets you to really... <laughs> well, I was going to say I picked one that I wasn't involved in, so I'm, I took the cowardly route. But you know, it's not an album, though. I was going to say Soul Rotation. It's not an album. Mm -hmm. no, it's not an album. The Smoking Banana Peels is not an album. It's okay, yeah, but you, your uh, Soul Rotation is an album. Yeah. 
I don't know. Yeah, I, like, that, that's I, I like a bunch of songs on that album. I think it's underrated. I but do. Whatever. The King in Yellow. I'd like to. I'd like a do over because I had a lot of great ideas. I had a lot of great, but I think that we weren't quite. I think we we're so happy to be all back together that we weren't saying, "Oh, let's think critically about this." That's why. That's why I think that um, that Pretty People is such a really great record because I think we learned a valuable lesson, or at least I did. I was like, "Okay, I'm going to be very careful with with songwriting." So I would. I, not that I'd like to wipe it out, but I'd love a do-over on that one. Well, you know the old, the old wives' tale? The old wives' tale when you're, you're knitting when a new album is being made? I did that with The King in Yellow, too. So maybe we need to uh, do a, a, re, a re, revisit The King in Yellow. Can I see your pupils? <laughs> I don't know. Can you? <laughs> but, but, the, but we weren't allowed to be able to revisit it. It said erase it. Can you guys hear that? No. Okay. I do. There's something sliding on the ground. Is it? It said you high? can't recreate uh, it. Well, it's on the ground above the ceiling. Yeah, we need the to move this the kids are, uh... Yeah. Uh, yeah, Rodney. Rodney apparently has somewhere to be. So we, no, I don't know somewhere to be, but uh, we have the number of questions that people keep. Everybody keeps answering. Yeah, um, we're we, down to I like. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we still have plenty. Of, we still have plenty. There's of time. editing. You can edit. Edit. We still We've have plenty of time. Six. I think we're doing great. Yep. And some of these, I can, some of these, I don't have answers for. No. Uh, is it my turn next? Well, did Dan do all of his three? I think so. Yeah. Yes. I think so. <laughs> uh, okay, my, my Jack Christensen asks, what was that little piece of paper that Dean appeared to purchase from Buck? Um, that was a strange little moment. So for those of you who don't know, we rehearse at a re uh, rehearsal studios, which is in Mania, Philadelphia. It's called Eastside Studios. And what I was simply doing was paying Buck for the two hours of rehearsal time. And he was giving me a, a paper receipt so that we can write it off on our taxes. Yes, the dead milkmen pay taxes. So that's all it was. Nothing clandestine. I don't know. Pretty, pretty, pretty basic. Um, uh, Jonathan Douglas asks, are you being held hostage in that room? The ceiling tiles are also starting to affect my enjoyment of the videos. Well, for one, we're not there anymore until this whole issue clears up. Um, but no, we're not. We actually pay to go there for a couple of hours every week. <laughs> so, uh, no, that's, that's, that's not. Uh, let's see. The third question that I have is, who's that man smoking the cigarette that always shows up in these? That's Rodney's answer. Joe knows everything. He put him in there. No. <laughs> Who is that guy? He's from. Uh... Um, okay, I'm trying to. I, I, yeah, I realized. Okay, now we have to do this time. Um, I when I first started doing these things, they were too clean. We the the, the reason that we like De the people like us like Debbie Friday and not Shania Twain is because we like rough edges left on stuff. So when I first did one of these and put them together, it was too slick, and I started thinking I need to dirty it up. And I started thinking about the young ones. And when I was learning to make all this stuff. Um, I was just filming stuff off of TV to, to put in, a, see if I could drop it in as fillers, almost like the young ones are new. And that was a guy who appeared on an episode of Hoarders. So there's this woman screaming. You don't get to see the whole clip. And then they cut to him. He's like, Ooh. And I was like, I had to go back and get it like a dozen times. And I'll do that occasionally with uh, weird stuff that shows up on what they call the learning channel, but there's no learning. But it was just to make it almost more like the young ones, just because you know, like I say, I like to leave the rough edges on things. I think it looks a lot better. It just doesn't look right if there's no rough edges. The people who do the damn show do a really good job of the same sort of thing, keeping it so it's not too slick. It looks punk rock, so. I'm not going to deal with my mother getting upset and having a heart attack. So, yeah, that's the third of my questions. I had all sort of inside, inside uh, information about these videos that we're making. So. Well, we can go back too if we have time left over. And just yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought, so I think it's your turn, Rodney. Okay, so my first question also comes from Jonathan Douglas. Yeah. Jonathan, you, you've been a busy little boy. <laughs> um, and he says, if you could have been a member of any band ever, which would it be and why? Big hugs from the UK. First of all, Jonathan, I don't hug. hug. Yeah, Big I know. I don't hug Jonathan. Okay, I'm like, I'm like Rain Man, but without the math. And also my family doesn't hug. My father, who was a steel worker, once said, what's the point of hugging somebody if they're just going to get killed in the mill the next day? <laughs> uh, as for your question, which band would I like to be in? 
Gee, that's a tough, coil. Um, and there's really only three answers to that question. Coil, coil, and coil. Uh, and why? Horse Rotivator, which is Sergeant Pepper for people who like music, uh, How to Destroy Angels, Scatology, uh, every, everything the coil did. I got into them late. I got into them in the, the mid to late 90s. I wish I'd gotten into them earlier. Um, I think about them a lot now because they're almost the soundtrack to everything that's going on. Um, and unfortunately, John Balance and Peter Christofferson uh, have passed on, which is sad, but I would be the last surviving member of Coil, which means I would have the rights to everything, which means the people who said, you know, you want to make Punk Rock Girl the musical? First, you got to make the Anal Staircase the musical. You know, stick some Pat Benatar in that. Um, that would be, just, so that would be awesome. That would have that, that sort of power. But I really do love Coil. Like I say, the reason there is a band called Icon of Coil and no Icon of Huey Lewis in the news is clear cut. So Coil would be the band that I would choose. All right, next question is Wait, from- We all have to answer that one. Oh, we all have to answer it? Okay, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot. I See, my, my rules in my head for this were different. All right, no, everybody- yeah, yeah. Can I think we all have to answer these questions. One yeah. is, um, uh, I would probably say, and I've mentioned them here before, XTC probably, I would love to be the drummer in XTC. Although, you know, they had a great drummer, but you know, I'd be into that. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Pam? Joe, do you want to answer? I would say Leibach. <laughs> oh my God, Joe and Leibach. Oh, that makes me so happy. I know they'd probably kick me out, but no, no, it Joe, would certainly no. be an interesting time, I think. Well, you can't play guitar, so I don't know if they'd let you in. <laughs> Who's guitar in Leibach albums? No, you know, he, oh. he's not a very good guitar player, so. Oh. Yeah, but live but I, I can play keyboard, yeah. sort of. I know. <laughs> I can play saws. I can play. I can play all kinds of non-instrument instruments. Joe, I just need a minute. Performance to art. Live <laughs> Huh? I just need a minute to think about you in live <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think there wouldn't oh, be a dollar in it. Oh. <laughs> and have you thought of somebody yet? Um, yeah, I I would say either uh, the Stickmen or uh, Mr. Bungle, mm -hmm. but I'm leaning more towards Stickman because um, I feel like I probably wouldn't have a conflict with him, but I probably wouldn't be able to take much of Mike Patton, but just from based on, on what I've heard from other people, but I shouldn't judge him. I don't want to judge him. Don't be a judger. Yeah, so I'm going to say Stickman because uh, I think Pete Baker has some more interesting stories. Yeah. Uh, but it ju I just think it would be um, really interesting to be in on the like the writing process of those songs because I've never quite understood how somebody can write uh, music like that. So I'm just really more fascinated in anything. That's my cool. Answer. My thing was I didn't care how fun it was to be in the band. I just knew I could end every argument with that. Like, well, why do you think we should just? Because I was in Coil, fucking Coil, All right? Although Joe's in, if Joe's in Leibach, that's yeah, it. Like that's yeah, the acceptable answer. We should, I thought everybody's going to go Coil, Coil, Coil. All right. So if if all right, next question. You know what? Yeah. Uh, did Joe answer? Yes, everybody answered. Okay. Yeah, Joe said Leibach. How can you forget that? Yeah, I'll yeah, never yeah. forget that. That's in my head forever. Um. I got a great story sometime I'll tell you about Patrick asking me if I wanted to go to North Korea to see Leibach. Um, anyway, so moving along, Andrew Webb, if that is your real name, uh, says, big question, and this is a not fairly big question, how far did you get on that album you were working on before you were quarantined? The answer is too damn far. <laughs> um, we had, we had uh, pretty much 10 albums, uh, 10 songs pretty much done. I went back and finished a couple I had ideas for. I do a thing on Sunday I call church because that's what you people pay me to do. You pay me to work on music on Sunday. Um, and I was, went back for every week and was tightening stuff and doing stuff like that. And like I said, we had, we had 10 songs ready, I would say, and, and probably two or three more in the can that we could have put together. And this is like, remember when you were a teenager and you would have the keg ready, somebody's ready to tap it, the pizza arrives, your buddy's firing up the bong, and all of a sudden the state troopers pull up in the driveway. <laughs> Coronavirus <laughs> is the state trooper in the driveway. <laughs> like, oh, but on the other hand, it does um, give us a chance to kind of start again. I've been thinking about the, um, the Gazelle Twin album, Pastoral, which is almost like an oral, in a way it's a lot like Coil, it's like an oral nightmare. It's been, uh, it's been in my head constantly. I just spent all the other day listening to it, um, I think what happens is whenever there is a, a tragedy or any sort of, you know, 
think the, the music industry hits that reset button. And that reset button says pop. And if you think the shit on your local freaking alt rock radio station is garbage, which it is, after this, it's going to be even worse. So I think we need to move in sort of an opposite direction. So I, I think I'm going to spend this Sunday making some harsh, harsh stuff. I think that, so yeah, so we got fairly close to it. Um, I kind of broke in a lot of my roles, which was don't write stuff about contemporary things to be able to go, well, why don't you write a song about, you know, this is going on now? I'm like, hey, I'm not Weird Al. I can get you Weird Al's number. I'm not freaking Weird Al. So I would say um, I'm going to spend a lot of time looking to probably Horse Rotivator. Thank you, Jonathan Douglas. And, uh, um, and, and, uh, um, and Pastoral by, by Gazelle Twin and, and come up with some nightmare stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure we had at least five songs that were almost ready to record and ready to go. I'll show you the chart. <laughs> yeah, I know. We have a chart. So that's cool. Yeah. Would you guys agree, Joe, Dan? Yeah. Yep. So we'll get back to it eventually. I was hoping. Come on, one of you. Contradict me. Come on. Come on. I'll Next question. You there. I'll choke the Leibach right out of you there, Talcum. <laughs> the, uh, the last question. Uh, what is a film or series uh, you recommend to people during quarantine? I didn't want to answer this part, but I'm going to tell you, Dispatch is from elsewhere. Uh, filmed here in Philadelphia, and it will break your heart. It is one of the smartest things on television. Today, I walked up to Fred Wynn's house up on 12th Street, where they show where he lives, and just got a picture of it. First time I've left the house. Uh, well, actually, I left the house yesterday for the first time uh, since early March, but I, I needed to walk, so uh, I did that. So, yeah, dispatches from elsewhere. Uh, the last episode is this Monday. Please go back and check it out. It is brilliant, and, and it is heartbreaking, and you will cry. So that You'll enjoy the crying. Uh, um, okay, or, oh, she's just going with the or. Uh, what is an, uh, we can go back, and everybody else can do both these together. Um, what is an album that influenced your playing? And that is easy. Uh, super easy. That's an album called Oil and Gold uh, from a band called Shriekback. And I first heard this album, or the first song I heard was called Nemesis. It was on the first Dead Milkman tour, 1985. We were in a parking lot. I tell you exactly where it was. And Philadelphia always had crap radio. We used to have classic rock radio, and now we have alt rock radio. Um, and so what happens is uh, this was this, this was a song called Nemesis. And at that time, we've been on this punk rock tour, and our friend Chuck Meehan has a saying called brain pain insane style of punk rock writing. I got a pain in my brain. It's driving me insane. And this was something very clever, very brilliant. And it really, uh, um, and they used, they, they rhymed uh, nemesis with parthenogenesis, which I thought was great. And it really made me rethink. And I go back and I listen to the album over and over again. So it's one of those uh, canons along with uh, um, I Barton Spears' APOC, and uh, the KLS, the White Room, that I keep in my life, and I'll go back and I'll revisit, uh, every, and Horse Rotivator, uh, and I'll revisit regularly. So yeah, that album changed everything. It changed the idea that I thought, oh wait, we can put keyboards in this stuff. And we don't have to, you know, we don't have to mimic the Ramones. There are other ways of doing things. So I hope that, that answers that question. So now you guys have to tell us about a show or a movie you would recommend to people under quarantine. quarantine and an album that changed the way you do things? Uh, I've been watching on, uh, I, I'm a fan of like, I, I, it's a kind of a cheesy genre, but like British detective shows. And there's one called George Gently. I think I may, may have even mentioned it before. It's set in the 1960s in the North country of England. So I've been working my way through that. I think I'm on season four right now. I think there were eight seasons, I don't know. Um, so that's a series that I've been watching. You can get it on through Amazon Prime, or I think it's on like the Brit Box or the Acorn. I forget what it's called. And what is an album that influenced your playing? I would have to say that um, I was uh, into uh, early Blondie and early Elvis Costello. The, the, the drummers for those bands, Clem Burke and uh, P. Thomas, were, are, two, are two of my favorite drummers ever and probably in the influence in my drumming, if I dare say that, um, they are so great. So, uh, you know, early Blondie and early Elvis Costello. So I'm, I'm not gonna narrow it down, but that stuff. Dan? Uh, so the first question was, which one? 
first question was a show or okay. movie you recommend to people under quarantine and the second um, album that influenced how you play i don't i i don't really um i don't really watch much tv but the kids have gotten really into the simpsons and i have a bunch of the dvds so they've been watching that and and some of the new ones um which are decent they're not bad um but I, 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 you know, going back to another big questions, I started reading David Copperfield again, because it's like, I think I decided, I was like, you know what, this is like a comfort book for me. And I realized the other two times I read it was like, I was going through something weird. So, and I'm, I guess I am now too. I'm fine, I'm good. Pick me up a dime bag of that something weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the other uh, was, Let's see. An album that influenced your playing. Yeah, influenced, yeah. Uh, well, besides Dave Blood, um, all of the albums, uh, was when I actually started, I started playing bass and thinking, you know what, I can do this because Dave Blood did it, because I really wanted to play guitar, but I was in a band with my cousins. They said, hey, why don't you just play bass? And I started playing bass, and I liked it okay. But uh, when I heard um, the Minutemen album, uh, What Makes a Man Start Fires, I thought, you know what, I can do a lot, I can <laughs> try to do a lot more with the bass than what I'm doing. Um, and Dave is amazing because he, he's like, he's like routine with, with some things. I'm not gonna go into that, but like Mike Watt seems like he's controlled chaos. And that album just, for me, was like, it, you know, it gave me, uh, it was proof that like bass is more than just, you know. More than root notes. Yeah. That was also the album I uh, chose, What Makes a Man Start Fires, uh, for D. Boone's playing. It was 1983. Uh, I was playing, I'd already met uh, Dave at that point, and uh, Milkman hadn't started playing shows yet, but it would be pretty soon after that. And I was just blown away by that album, and uh, D that chunka chunka style I tried to emulate. So it changed the way I play guitar. Uh, of course, I can never uh, match uh, D Boone's playing, but I didn't. Know, I couldn't see what he was doing or how he was doing. I didn't. I wouldn't see the the band play for an, another year after that till 1984. But that was the album for me. Or Buzz and Hal uh, under the influence of Heat, which is actually an EP. I got them around the same time. And, um, a series to watch, um, I'm gonna pick F is for Family. It's a Netflix uh, animated show, uh, not for children at all. There's nudity, there's sex. Um, but it, I like it, I like it because it, I find it charming. Um, it's one of those things where you have to watch from the beginning because it's a storyline thing. You know, if you just plop in the middle, you, you'll probably be, thrown off or put off but um it takes place in the 70s and that's when i grew up and i i find it interesting to see that depict that time period depicted in suburban life i have a question yes did the Minutemen ever answer that question what makes a man start fires on that? <laughs> like, no, that's just lazy songwriting. Like I answer. It was, it's a, it's a it's a Raymond Petty it's a Raymond Pettibone drawing. They just took the title from it. Oh, try to blame put the blame on somebody else. Oh, we can't tell you. We can't. Nah, it's somebody else's drawing. Well, I think that covers all. It's really weird that you picked the album too. I'm really glad I went. I first. thought it was re weird that you picked it. But okay, we're weird. You guys didn't consult ahead of time, did you? No, we didn't. That's cheating if you did. <laughs> Is it? Oh, uh, Joe, we should say Joe thing. wanted to be in Leibach. I can't get past that. <laughs> I don't know why you can't get past that. <laughs> <laughs> Were we on tour one time when we found out the writer included a, a requirement that they needed a like a special chair? A 100-year-old chair and a stag's head. But one time, I quickly... Well, uh, I have a special uh, phone ringer for Patrick Rogers because he calls it like sometimes three, four in the morning and he'll say things like, Rodney, do you know Fr uh, uh, Freddie Mercury? I'm saying, I don't think he's with us anymore, Patrick. But, um, but he'll say, no, I need his music. But he one time called me late at night to know, see if I wanted to go to North Korea with him to see live. Dan, are you knitting again? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. 
I'm, I'm trying to like uh, knit in the you know time where I'm not doing anything. I'm not, I'm doing something now, but I'm trying to uh, like mindlessly. I don't know. Keep your hands busy. Yes. When I went to get the picture of Gibby, my my this thing came off the wall. Oh no! <laughs> no. I don't know my own strength. Uh. All right. Well, I think that we covered at least what twelve questions. That's pretty good. I was worried. I was so afraid it wasn't going. Yeah, I'm sure, we could have done it. Joe, I think now it's that you you want to get back to the the uh, schedule and you want to choose the question for next week, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll choose it. All right, you'll you'll send it out. Okay. Next week's question is going to be about Leibach, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sleeping with the lights on tonight. <laughs> 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 weird it out i can't i got uh, i think i wet myself <laughs> <sighs> all right well i hope everybody's doing okay um, both you guys and our our viewers i hope everybody's okay and uh, you know just keep on keeping on and we'll see you again in a week all right see you guys later all right, all right. take care guys bye bye i never know how to end this stop it <laughs> One Saturday, I took a walk to Zipperhead. I meet a girl there. She almost knocked me dead. Lie girl, you look so odd. Let's sing God is God, then I'm going to hurl. You're for me. Lie girl. I took her out to the pick. Nick had a Girl Scout jamboree. Golly, did those Girl Scouts stand at Leibach Girl in me? Leibach Girl, let's go slam dance. Got something in my pants, and then I'm going to hurl. You're for me, Leibach Girl.